So here's what to expect for the I don't know, next half an hour, 40 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to break down the wicked problem that is chronic homelessness, at least in the way that I see it, and um, just kind of get underneath the layers that are some of the buzzwords of homelessness. Then I'll address that question of like, what's the deal? So really why it, um, some of the main critiques as to why people are helping the homeless. Then I'll address three barriers. Um, then I'll touch on 100,000 homes, which is this really wonderful initiative that's kind of sweeping the nation in many cities. And then finally, I'll see if there's kind of a wicked solution for Syracuse, and we can chat a little bit about that. So the wicked problem that I see in chronic homelessness is adequately housing those facing chronic homelessness in the United States has, for decades, faced a number of roadblocks. So lack of affordable housing and the interests, traditions, and limitations of the many service providers all inhibit permanent housing for some of the country's most vulnerable. Now that's a, that's a bear of a problem with a lot in there. So I was going to break it down little by little. So adequately housing. Now according to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that is everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. I mean, college students don't have that help. I don't have that. So assuming that home, uh, the homeless can get that, some of the most vulnerable in the country, is very, a very, very difficult thing to attain. Next is the definition of chronic homelessness. So a chronically homeless individual is someone who has experienced homelessness for a year or longer, or has experienced at least, three, at least four episodes of homelessness in the last three years, and has a disability. Now, it's clear anyone who falls into the gap, that category that something is missing. I mean, they'd be living in emergency shelters, living outdoors, um, and even on friends' couches labels them as homelessness. And now this isn't an issue that's just kind of sprung up. In its form, however, it has kind of sprung up recently. But 1930s, during the Great Depression, homelessness was a very transient thing, so people were going from one place to another. In the 50s and 60s, Skid Rose formed, so vast neighborhoods of homelessness, it made homelessness kind of more permanent in cities. Um, in the 1970s, there was a large deinstitutionalization. And that created more homeless, but also created more nonprofits to address the growing homeless needs. In the 1980s, there was funding cuts to low income housing. In the 1990s, there was a scale up of direct services available. Now, that included more food, clothing, um, and uh, kind of emergency shelter available. However, the homeless numbers still remain quite high. Um, in the 2000s, federal government support came in, um, particularly in light of. This, this growing trend of veterans becoming homeless. And in the 2010s, um, bold new goals coupled with new initiatives that I'll speak about soon kind of really uh, took into effect. So these were lack of affordable housing and the interests, traditions, and limitations of the many service providers. Those are the barriers that I'll address in a few minutes. And then all of this inhibits the country's most vulnerable. And in January 2013, there were over 610,000 homeless in the United States. And from a study that was done in 2000, the life expectancy um, for a chronically homeless person is 45 years. So it's uh, an issue that clearly needs to be addressed. Now, there's the regular questions of like, what's the deal? So aren't homeless shelters the cheapest option, or it would cost too much to house all of the homeless? And those, I think, are, are legitimate questions. Um, there's the expectation that if people were housed in a dorm, it would really be um, the, the cheapest way possible. Um, however, a lot of these questions rarely think about the externalities. And there was a seminal study done in 2010 um, conducted by the Economic Roundtable with a central question that was investigated is the public cost for people living in supportive housing compared to similar people that are homeless. And they studied 10,193 of the homeless in LA County. And um, they compared costs when individuals were housed compared to when they were homeless. And if you look at this graph here, individuals when supportively housed, it cost roughly $605 a month compared to those living in a homeless shelter or outside, 
where it literally costs almost $3,000 a month. Now this is taking into account health and service um, costs, private hospitals, all the way up through uh, um, time spent in jail to probation. Um, and it's clear that the vast difference between those who are homeless compared to those who are supportively housed. This goes across almost all populations, from those affected with HIV AIDS, to those dealing with mental illness, um, to men, to women, to veterans, and uh, all the way those, down to those who've worked in the past three years, this discrepancy. And here's just a little bit more specifics on the, on the exact numbers. So, for example, a, a female, a homeless female, um, it would cost roughly $2,800 a month compared to the 539 in support of housing. Now, the next kind of question is, I think, a little bit more difficult to address, um, just because it really touches at more of a, an emotional side, is why invest in a population ravaged by substance abuse and unmedicated mental illness? And really, why should we care about the homeless? So there's a lot of people who will look and see a population that you might consider lazy or just really not even putting in the effort that they need to make their way out. And I think it's important to look at who really makes up the homeless. And many, 38% um, report alcohol use problems, 26 report drug use problems, 39 some sort of mental health problems, and 66% either report substance abuse in our mental health problems. So this is a clear hurting population that is really struggling with whether it be mental illness or drug and alcohol abuse problems. And um, letting it go kind of unchecked is, is something that, I mean, I personally couldn't live with. And um, as a society, we're finding it's not only incredibly expensive to have homelessness, but just personally, humanely, it's not, it's not a good thing. Um, further, even if not falling into one of those categories, it's incredibly hard to advance in a shelter system where those things are so, so prevalent. Now, quick pit stop. Anything new there to anyone or anything kind of jump out at you that didn't, maybe didn't make sense or was kind of like an aha sort of thing? Okay, cool, 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 cool. Again, Please feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions as we go through this. How about, can you guys hear me in the back? Is this yeah. okay? Great. So I'm going to address the barriers now. And barrier number one is, I think, the biggest one, no safe and affordable housing. Now there's a couple things going on here. On the top is a, a screenshot of the Syracuse Model, Model Neighborhood Corporation, who provides affordable housing to not only homeless, but to low-income families. And um, probably for the last couple of months, this has been the, sorry, there are no available rentals at this time. Please check again later. I check this pretty regularly. And that has been the, the theme for here in Syracuse, just this very lack of affordable property. But that's not only in Syracuse. So if you look down here in Minnesota, where the, the um, minimum wage is 725, which equals 15,000 a year, um, and in order to uh, afford a one-bedroom apartment in Minnesota, uh, you would have to make $27,000 a year. So just the availability of affordable housing is, is one of the largest factors keeping people from getting into housing. And then if you look at here, which I think is much more telling, is the emergency assistance to adults. So the average uh, homeless man who's getting emergency assistance, temporary assistance benefits, is $350 per month. Now, since 2005, the average uh, Syracuse rent has increased from 588 to $693, making any affordable housing almost non-existent for those um, who are living on temporary assistance. Now, in a, in a needs survey conducted by organizations here in Syracuse in 2012, um, of homeless men and women in the shelters, 28% uh, said that a better place to live would help improve their quality of life. Another, um, the other 28% is a better job. So when I think about that, I think that they need more money and a better place to live, essentially more affordable, um, safe housing. 
Now, barrier number two, limitations of service providers. Um, I worked at a large shelter here in Syracuse. It housed about 115 men a night. Um, and guys would sometimes be placed in these permanent housings um, outside of the shelter. And it was always this kind of like, okay, well, I'll see you in six months. Because after six months, all case management provided to these men would um, dry up because there just wasn't the funding. So literally, it would be like clockwork. Six months after these guys moved out of the shelter, they would be right back there. And I think this speaks to limited case management support of, uh, of the service agencies. Um, further, agencies can't afford more appropriate apartments. So they're working with landlords who will put in the, the um, they're working with private landlords who are trying to turn a profit. Um, so, they're, so they're obviously going to find some of the kind of cruddier, not nicest apartments here in Syracuse, and that's the housing that they'll use. And then finally, there's agencies that take on so many different initiatives. Um, for example, the agency that ran the shelter that I worked at had stuff with refugees, had things with um, senior citizens, with youth, just really spread themselves thin. And I think this really hurt their clients in the long run. Now, barrier number three is traditional housing models. So many agencies expect that first you get sober, um, medicated on your feet, and then we'll provide you with housing. That would be makes sense, except uh, as Mark Hobarth, one of the largest homeless advocates in the United States, said, it's hard to do homelessness sober. It's incredibly difficult to go in and be living next to a guy two feet away from you and wake up every single day, have to go through the same process over and over and not think about drinking, not think about um, going and using. Um, overcoming homelessness in a homeless shelter is so, so hard. And um, so these unreal expectations from agencies to get sober before finding housing um, ultimately results in more visits to the ER, higher rates of incarceration, and ultimately prolonged homelessness. Now again, uh, it's got number two. Any, any thoughts? Any, um, anything that kind of strikes you as, like, what well, should be happening, or?
speaks also to a really important thing of support and having that kind of case management support that after six months, some agencies can't necessarily provide. But thank you for sharing. That's in Philadelphia? Right on. And make it happen here. Yeah. Um, so, Promo mentioned this housing first model. This is being initiated by 100, um, 100,000 homes, particularly here in the United States. There's a video, a 60 minutes did a wonderful expose on um, the work that they're doing, and it certainly explains it better than I ever could. So I hope we can just take a couple minutes and watch this. treatment for drug or alcohol problems or mental illness may not sound like a wise idea, but that's what's... Giving apartments to homeless people who've been on the streets for years before they've received treatment for drug or alcohol problems or mental illness may not sound like a wise idea, but that's what's being done in cities across America in an approach that targets those who've been homeless the longest and are believed to be at greatest risk of dying especially with all of this cold weather. There are people who once might have been viewed as unreachable, but cities and counties affiliated with a movement known as the 100,000 Homes Campaign have so far managed to get 80,000 of them off the streets. Local governments and nonprofit groups do most of the work. The money comes mostly from existing federal programs and private donations, and there's evidence that this approach saves taxpayers money. If it sounds too good to be true, I'll take a look at what's been happening in Nashville, one of the latest cities to join the 100,000 Homes campaign. The story will continue in a moment. You ain't buddy? Robert. In a storage facility on the outskirts of Nashville, outreach worker Ingrid McIntyre introduced us to Robert McMurtry. <laughs> Robert, I want to introduce you to my friend Anderson. She'd come to ask him some questions about his health. How many times have you been to the emergency room in the past three months? Uh, twice. Robert told Ingrid he had a lot of medical problems, HIV, hepatitis C, and throat cancer. He was getting treatment at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, but living in this storage locker without a toilet or running water. He bathed in a stream by the side of the road. He said he'd been homeless for three years. How old? I'm 48. Right. I'm 46, so we're two years apart. It's nice to see someone else with gray hair. <laughs> he said he used to work in the construction business, but fell on hard times after he lost his job and became ill. A friend took pity on him and allowed him to stay in his storage locker for the past three months. I never imagined I'd ever be homeless because I had her. I, I really worked really hard my whole life, and it was just devastating, really, when it happened, because I never imagined that I would be in this condition. Ingrid McIntyre runs a nonprofit called Open Table Nashville. It's been working with the 100,000 Homes Campaign to survey the city's homeless and identify those at greatest medical risk. Do you think he's at high risk? I mean, he's one of the most vulnerable people that I know. Three days after interviewing Robert, she returned with an offer that was hard to believe. Do you want to have an apartment for you tomorrow? <laughs> Do you want it? Yes. <laughs> the following day, wow, <laughs> Robert moved in to his very own apartment. This is great. <laughs> it's in a private building in downtown Nashville. He wouldn't have to bathe in that stream anymore. The apartment has one bathroom, one bedroom, and access to this rooftop pool. Until fairly recently, someone like Robert would have to jump through a series of bureaucratic hoops and go through a treatment or job training program before getting permanent housing. The 100,000 Homes campaign advocates using an approach first developed in New York in which the homeless are given housing first. What we're really aiming for in this movement is that person that's been on the streets, in many cases for decades, um, who you walk past and you're like, oh, I can't even imagine this person be able to be in housing. The hardcore homeless. The hardest core of the hardest core. Um, who also happen to be at the highest risk for dying on the streets. 
Becky Canis works for a group called Community Solutions, which created the 100,000 Homes campaign. She says most of the 600,000 people who are homeless in the United States on any given night are on the streets for relatively short periods of time, usually less than a month. But it's the chronic cases, people homeless for more than a year, who Canis says are most in need of help. They're out of friends who will let them sleep on their couch. They're out of friends who will... Great. So I think we can, we can leave it at there. Again, this, what kind of makes sense there? Is there anything confusing? Like, this very much flies in the face of, as they said, what's traditionally happened here in the States. But um, as you kind of think about it, to me it makes a lot more sense, right? Like, how possible is it for someone who's really dealing with these addictions and unmedicated mental illnesses to, to, to be sober, to, to really advance if they're in that environment? So it makes sense to me. I mean, is there anything still kind of confusing or, or you kind of be like, yeah, please? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, I think, I think the model makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. because for one thing, a lot of these factors are really compounding. So like once you're homeless, you know, that destabilization is gonna lead to other issues that are gonna prevent you from, you know, being able to find work, let's say. Yeah. Um, and so I think there's also an issue here that in, in a bunch of classes this semester and throughout the year, one thing that's been emphasized is that people, poverty is, poverty is actually pretty fluid. And so people are kind of dipping down and coming back out of poverty mm -hmm. in a pretty fluid manner. And so the purpose of the safety net is to, I think, kind of prevent um, certain shock factors, if you will, from completely uh, allowing certain things to compound for a person to where they just simply cannot get out of the situation that they're in. And kind of something the gentleman in the video that, you know, as soon as he lost his job, which led to homelessness, which led to, you know, that he had a host of medical issues that he's dealing with. So if you can keep them housed and, and at least imbue a little bit of stability, even as they're facing some kind of difficult situation, ultimately you come out with something that's much more cost effective mm -hmm. because otherwise, you know, the types of services that he now needs are going to be much more extensive in order to kind of, you know, Again, if he's at least able to be housed, you know, you can prevent a lot of those things from occurring. Yeah. I was just thinking um, about kind of unemployment and how we have like a huge um, insurge of unemployment, which has now led, especially with the market, but also led to people without homes um, after 2009. Mm -hmm. And um, the model does make a lot of I guess I was wondering if, if the focus, if the primary benefit 
speak to national statistics or anything, but I can speak to two men who I currently live with who moved out of the homeless shelter and are now stably employed and sober for some time now. And it's only because of having a stable living environment that's been made possible. Now, I don't think every single person who would be accepted in this 100,000 homes movement would be able to hold a job and be employed. That being said, though, they won't be going to the ER every other night, or they won't be ending up in jail um, like uh, one week out of the month. So even if you look at it from a cost perspective, they're saving people money, and also it's much more humane than, than asking them to sleep under a bridge or asking them to sleep two feet next to a so I think it's, it's kind of a, on a case-by-case -case basis, but it's also those baby steps that and it's, it's certainly better than the alternative. So this is more of a clarification, but so the project here, this 100,000 homes, this is, I guess I see two issues. One, like housing the currently homeless, but then also having stable programs in place that prevent people from ever really, become, or at least the great majority of people mm -hmm. from ever becoming homeless in the first place. So that you really head off a lot of that instability that comes from having been homeless even for a short time period, yeah. that could potentially, you know, like I said, cause you to, to cause other issues. So this is really focused on getting the homeless that are currently on the streets into yeah. housing. Is it also going to try and again prevent that those periods of homelessness? I think it would be incredibly interesting to see how money saved through this could be put into, for example, affordable housing stock or. Um, um, and I, I think that's the real bear, the real crux of it, is figuring out how to house people for cheaper yeah. and increase that stock. So, I don't know, I would like to go on to maybe how this may be tangibly done here in Syracuse, increasing, uh, increasing the housing stock, um, providing that kind of case management support for, for men making their way out of the shelter system. And I'd just like to be, give a big thanks to, to Dan. Dan did this drawing for me. Um, and it's actually taken, this is a vacant lot here in Syracuse's south side, and Dan put in the, the two kind of blue houses on where the vacant lot is, but it's my dream for now. And, and kind of a shameless plug here, um, Zed and Jack did a wonderful, wonderful video um, that I'd just like to share with you guys. It's three minutes. They kind of really explains what my mission is here for there, so I'd like to share it with you guys. Well, I'm Andrew Lynette. I'm from Syracuse, New York. I'm a graduate student at Syracuse University's Maxwell School. And uh, my idea is the tiny home, Big House. This is my home. That? That's true. I open the doors to men. Moving out of the shelter system. Four men moved in with me. We formed a strong community founded in stability and support. For a few of the men, a stable, safe, and healthy living environment was the key to overcoming the shelter system. The home is now our home. In 2011, I began to peddle the possibilities, an organization that offered group bike rides to the homeless. The program is facilitated at the Brady Faith Center, a community center on the south side of Syracuse, where I sit as a board member. There are hundreds of vacant lots and tax delinquent properties in the city of Syracuse. The Greater Syracuse Land Bank, an organization dedicated to revitalizing its forgotten properties, has already acquired over 200 the continued growth of the land bank represents a city committed to using innovative strategies to solve a long-standing problem. With so much vacant land and desire to see it utilized, it is a shame that on any given day in Onondaga County, there are 424 individuals facing homelessness. Why can't this look like this? Why can't every vacant lot have a tiny home? We'll build the first on this 88 square foot trailer. Working with Syracuse School of Architecture students, 
and developed plans for home number one. While small, only 88 square feet, the home will have hot water, a shower, a composting toilet, a propane heater, a lofted bed, and plenty of storage. Further, it can be constructed for only $1,500. So here we are on one of the hundreds of vacant lots here in Syracuse. And looking forward, this is a model for how we can best house the homeless. Using these vacant lots, using tiny homes to really support men who are coming out of the shelter system. Um, I really think we can fast forward to a better model of housing Syracuse's homeless and utilizing vacant lots and tiny homes is the way to do it. This is the first one and I'm excited to see where it ends up. And with the help of Fast Forward, I'm sure we can get it off the ground and move it. Thank you. Alright, so first and foremost, I need a pair of jeans. <laughs> So I think it, it, it really kind of starts at um, that partnership with the Greater Syracuse Land Bank and investing in getting those, those vacant lots utilized and um, really starting to increase the housing stock here in Syracuse. So next, it's, it's inviting men who, I, my initial thought is to start working with men. Um, there are plenty of homeless women here in Syracuse as well, but start with men facing homelessness and as they go through, um, as they go through, uh, whether it be a homeless shelter or a soup kitchen or time with the Onondaga County, um, they're then connected to tiny hearts and uh, excuse me, tiny homes, big hearts. And then my dream would really be to see it going straight from like that hundred uh, thousand homes movement going straight from the the streets right into a home. So. Yeah, I mean, these are a couple tiny home communities uh, around the country. This one up top is in Austin, Texas. This one down at the bottom is in uh, Olympia, Washington. And uh, I can just really see it happening here in Syracuse. And so, thank you. Andy. So, I, there is precedent for this, in other words? Like, there, these are fully fledged programs that are occurring in other states? Um, not necessarily working with homeless, but there's, there's many, many tiny home communities all across the country.
adaptable to different contexts and different areas? Um, again, I'm always kind of hesitant to do that because I, I see why this is can work because I have good relationships, good connections here in Syracuse. And you have the land bank. And, then, and there's the land bank. That being said, though, there's tons of cities around the country that have vacant land problems. And um, perhaps if, if this takes off, people might see, oh, this can happen in my city. And then people have connections there might be able to implement it. But I think a big part of this is I have some good roots here. And I think that's why I'm well fitted to take it out, take it on. But yeah, perhaps down the line. So one of the things you talked to me about is how uh, like one of the issues in Syracuse specifically is that a lot of the services that exist for homeless now, or the case management for guys specifically, is, I mean, there's the one issue of how it doesn't, it's not the longevity of the problem, it doesn't go, but it's also sort of just separate, like there's different people doing different things. Um, and you've talked before about how in your plan, um, one of the benefits of it would be not only that it's just a house on commission, but also that case management would just walk in one place, right? Sort of like just saying things we don't know. But I guess, could you like explain, I know that you're still thinking about it and stuff, but like touch on maybe how the existing service organization would work with it, like as it grows, we work with it, and like, um, and what it would look like more generally. But I guess the case management so. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's the most essential piece, I really think. Um, and again, I, I don't want to knock on what organizations are doing because they're doing terrific work and saving a lot of lives, but it's just a, a matter of, I think, a matter of time and, and where they're not addressing that long term investment in the men and women that they're housing. Now, what it would look like, though, is that I, I would see this organization, this agency, whatever it might be, taking on really specific roles, just housing and just case management, and leaving maybe the emergency shelter and food to a myriad of other services that are available here. Um, now, I don't know if that necessarily answers your question, but it, it definitely narrows the focus of tiny homes, big hearts, and can be more specific about what they address and don't address. And I think that's really important. Um, so I don't know.
Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, there's a, a woman who's a grad student there who did those plans for us and has been very invested in kind of making this first home work. And um, I, I think that that's, that's an example of how you can really kind of utilize resources here at SU, whether it be in the architecture department or in the PA department helping go through the, the process that is putting a 501c3 together or going through, I don't know, Newhouse to get publicity. Um, I think that just leveraging the power of this university of, um, is a really kind of important thing in the this work. And uh, my hope is to see, see more of that, more of that kind of happen. But specifically with the architecture school, it's only been with, with one student right now who's shared it with her, her professors. And, but I think it would certainly go forward. Just kind of off the table's question. Do you know, you mentioned that in the video, that there are over 400 homeless and out of town in Dr. Mm -hmm. What's Do you know what the composition is of those? How many of the how what percent of those there are single men? Or? Yeah, the majority are single men. I think majority. it's like 300, like in the upper 300s are single men. The rest are, are women and children. Yeah, so a, a lot of single men. Is yeah. part of that because there are simply more service agencies that serve specifically women and children? Or? Maybe, I, I don't know. That might be it. I mean, there are there are a number of shelters, and the permanent housing for women has been much more successful than for for men here in Syracuse. So, is it your read that kind of the the category of homeless single men has been neglected a little bit? Or? I think so. I mean, it, it, think about yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in a short answer, yes. And I think that they really have become kind of this forgotten population. I don't perceive them as being forgotten. I perceive them as they don't offer opportunities for sustainable long-term housing. Like for men, only shelters are offered, where for families, like they can stay longer, where the men are only really offered the night. So I think they get the services on a day-to-day -day basis, where this is kind of building the continuum to give them something sustainable for a longer period of time. That's how I, like, because I've done a few volunteer projects, and I don't, think they're neglected, I think they view them as we will give them what they need for today, right. not give them what they need for a year. With the type of services yeah. they're mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I still think that's neglected though. That's well, just I the way yeah, but it, yeah. they're just not, focused on sustainability, I don't think, for the homeless men at all. Um, can you talk about more uh, when your first house was going to be built, how mm -hmm. it's yeah. <laughs> really excited. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my sincere hope is that it will become kind of a weekend project until I graduate, and then after that, just take off and really put it into into place. Now it's on a trailer because we don't have any land yet. But um, my hope is that once it's built and and by the time the graduation comes around, we'll have all this stuff in place to really start chatting with the land bank and say, okay, we're going to use this land and. Um, by fall, we rolled out on a piece of property, and, and um, there's certainly a couple of guys in mind who I would love to see move into it, but and they've shared their real interest in it as well. But um, again, it's it's still meeting all the different players, different stakeholders, and not stepping on people's toes. And then also, have you, um, have you worked with um, like the VA and um, the hospitals or the So in Syracuse, they're doing a great job. Like they, they really are. Um, those veterans, the, the very first question they're asked when they enter the shelter is, are you a veteran? And if so, then and there's this like, okay, bam, you know, the keys in within a week. Um, so they're doing a really good job of that. And um, which almost makes me wonder, it's, well, why can't that be done for all other populations? But, yeah. Great guys, thank you so much for, for sitting in on this. I really appreciate the questions. and. Um, you can hear me at the back. Yes, sounds excellent. Like so. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for coming along to the security session of the 2014 Maxwell Conference. Um, so what we're going to do, we're kind of uh, just seeing how this goes with how the group dynamics work and stuff. But what we're going to do is we're going to start off with our four experts up here at the front. We're going to go down the line and they're going to introduce themselves and talk a bit about the 
about their interest and, and what they what they bring to the table here. Um, you should all have a white paper on the wicked problem of transnational security threats. So that's just a, a brief background. Those are some examples, topics that we you can discuss and use to bring up in reference, but that's not an exhaustive list. That was just the, the four that we thought of uh, when writing the paper. So feel free to bring anything else you want. Um, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to start off with Professor Murray going to say a couple of words about uh, the topic and what, and what he brings to it, and then we're going to go down the line. And then I think we're going to throw open the staff with to a panel discussion. So I will happily run around with the, the mic and uh, let you ask questions. And then maybe, depending on, how the, depending on how the session goes, we might break up into smaller groups to discuss them. Questions have been arised. We might just keep in a panel session, so we'll see see how it goes, see how the group's going. So um, I think that's what we're going to do. So without further ado, uh, sir. Thank you, Alex, and it's uh, good to be with you. Can you hear me in the back? Is it the acoustics okay? Good. Uh, before I start, why don't we just do a quick introduction of the three other panelists? I think I'll ask uh, Cameron and Ray and uh, Isaac just to give a quick background. And uh, with that, Cameron, do you want to kick it off? Testing. Hello? Should I just use this? All right, sounds good. Uh, so just a quick background on myself. Um, I feel like I did this earlier, but um, I was born and raised in Chicago, but I studied anthropology in undergrad, so kind of bring a cultural aspect to my studies here at the Maxwell School, studying IR and uh, public policy. But mostly I've kind of been focused on transnational security threats, which is sort of fitting for MaxCon 2014. Um, I sort of had the privilege uh, over last semester and, and some of this semester to study uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, so that's kind of maybe going to be speaking to that today um, in the breakout sessions maybe later. Um, but in undergrad I kind of focused a little bit on the Middle East um, and I studied Arabic quite a bit, but lately I've kind of been moving towards Africa and West Africa, thus the connection with AQIM. But um, that's sort of the, the, the insights that maybe I can bring to today, and I'm by no means uh, an expert, Alex. Uh, whatever you said about being an expert, I'm, I'm definitely not an expert, just somebody who has had the opportunity to study this group extensively. So, thanks for being on. I'm happy to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Ray Vallis. I'm an Army War College Fellow here for the year, working at INSCIT. Um, I've been conducting research on MS-13 for the past year uh, in El Salvador, and my most recent assignment was commanding a joint task force in El Salvador, uh, where I did have a Colombian engineer contingent uh, working for me as part of the uh, task force. So I had the opportunity to work closely with Colombians who had been in the Zona Roja in Colombia and get some of their uh, insights on what that was like. Uh, other than that, I've worked in Taiwan for a brief period, uh, conducting special operations training for the Taiwanese special forces. Uh, a year of peacekeeping in Egypt, and uh, a year of combat in Iraq before that. So I'm just happy to be here and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Isaac Field. I am a visiting assistant professor here at uh, Maxwell in the College of Law. I teach uh, courses at the Maxwell School, International Security and uh, Peacekeeping, and this year I'm also teaching Humanitarian Action. Uh, my interests are bifurcated between uh, looking at the conditions that facilitate weak demo democracies. Uh, I've just recently completed a book manuscript on Pakistan, uh, looking at the role of social identity groups in Pakistan, how they're established, how they're maintaining uh, themselves, and the role of violence uh, in sustaining those groups. My other interest is in post-conflict reconstruction, predominantly the uh, lack of a gender discourse uh, when you were looking at, um, at reconstruction. Um, I argue that um, when we're engaging in reconstructions, we need to place gender at the front of the discourse as opposed to at the development issue. So uh, those are some of the issues that I deal with. Thank you. Okay, thanks to the three of you. And um, uh, welcome to everybody that is here in a very diverse and international uh, audience that we have uh, this afternoon. And uh, for those of you that have been here all day, I commend you for the effort you put into this. And I know it's been a good conference, but it's uh, good to be here with uh, the rest of you. Uh, my name is Bob Moret. I'm on the faculty here at the Maxwell School in the Department of Public Administration and International Affairs. And um, I, I've worked in the 
national and international security environment for many years. I was a career uh, Navy officer working national security matters, both uh, defense and the intelligence community. And uh, that'll probably color the perspective I give you, just as uh, we've mentioned earlier with some of the other folks that have done presentations uh, here today. Just a quick administrative note, after I make my remarks, uh, I have to leave, and it's not because anybody has said anything uh, offensive, but just when you see me leave, don't think, get the wrong impression, uh, we have to welcome back what's called honor flight at the airport here in about an hour at Syracuse, which are all the World War II veterans, aging uh, veterans, that uh, there's a program that we fly them down on a day trip on a charter uh, flight from Syracuse, and we welcome them back at the end of the day in uniform and so forth. And that ceremony is, uh, as I said, in about an hour and 15 minutes the, this evening. And it's something that was set up months ago, so it, I have to make that commitment. So apologies, but uh, not really apologies for leaving early, because it's a very important audience. One of the last chances that uh, these people will have to go and see the World War II Memorial in Washington. Uh, just another metric for you, the average age of the participants in this honor flight is 89. And, uh, and there are two doctors on the airplane with them, which is necessary. So, but it's, uh, it's an important program, and I'll be doing that right after there. Okay, as um, uh, Alex and uh, the others were saying, the topic uh, for this uh, discussion and roundtable is transnational terrorist and security threats. And what I'll do just to frame the discussion this afternoon is to talk about first what... Um, the kind of broader definition that we can use for transnational security threats, which are uh, broader and deeper than a lot of people anticipate probably. And then I'll talk just briefly about some of the recent dynamics uh, relative to transnational security matters. And then uh, at that point, I'll turn it over to this capable uh, panel and then uh, let them pick it up and run with it from there. Uh, for starters, uh, I would like to just mention uh, 10 transnational security threats. And I say that because I think very often we focus too heavily on perhaps just one or two of them at the expense of the others. And uh, particularly in this day and age, as outlined in the paper that Alex routed around to all of you, which was on the web page for today's conference, I think it had a, a pretty good um, review of qualitative and quantitative approaches to transnational threats. It is both the numbers of threats that we have to deal with, but also the geographic scope and uh, the things that we've already mentioned from some of the panel members because transnational effects, uh, transnational threats rather, affect all of the uh, continents around the world and the broadest uh, geography we have around the globe and we ought to uh, acknowledge that. Okay, what I've done today is I've listed 10 transnational threats. And there won't be a quiz on these, so I'll just go ahead and mention them. Uh, but the um, they are not in order of importance, but I think they are all very important, and they do comprise things which we can rely less and less, as you saw in the, uh, the write-up for today's uh, discussion, uh, things that you can hold nation-states responsible for. In each case, you can hold nation-states responsible for some of the activity, but increasingly it's done by other groups that operate, operate outside of national structure and what we describe, as I'll comment on in a second, in ungoverned or semi-governed areas. The first one, uh, in the view of uh, most of us, the most serious is nuclear, uh, and also radiation associated with nuclear weapons. And that is probably the most significant transnational threat that we have today. And just for a rough order of magnitude, as, as you may all know, there are approximately um, 18,000 nuclear weapons in the world today, and most of them in Russia and the United States, uh, limited numbers in countries like Pakistan, none in Iran, North Korea, which is a matter of concern, smaller numbers in some of the other nuclear-powered states. But the other thing associated with that, when you get outside of the nation-state rubric, is the radiation associated and the precursor materials for nuclear weapons, which tend to be less regulated and in less control than um, the, the weapons themselves that are in the hands of nation-states. Uh, in the second category, the ones that are probably the most worrisome are the ones in Russia, which has approximately 9,000 nuclear weapons, many of them in a bad state of decay, and for many of them, the security of which is not as good as it ought to be, which the, uh, the Russians freely admit. On the whole, they tend to be uh, fairly good stewards of their arsenal, but the biggest constraint that they have, quite frankly, is the economics associated with nuclear security, which is prohibitively expensive, as I've alluded to, both in terms of just conventional security 
locks and compounds and fences and so forth, but also the, um, the basic science of nuclear weapons and the degradation that so many of them are having because they are so old. So again, a big transnational issue, uh, nuclear-related security, not just for uh, the weapons themselves, but also for radiological weapons, uh, radiological materials. Uh, somebody mentioned to me uh, four or five years ago, and I've never forgotten this, it was Ambassador Ken Brill who wrote, ran the uh, National Counterproliferation Center. He said, you know, for the people in the intelligence community around the world, if any nuclear weapon ever goes off for the next 10 years for any reason, they won't remember anything else about you. And there's probably something to that. And uh, the possibility that that could happen, most likely due to an accident rather than through any sinister approach, is, is more likely than people realize, just because of the dawning numbers that we deal with around the world. So transnational concern number one, nuclear weapons and associated radiation. Going down the list, uh, number two, a chemical. Weapons, fairly easy to produce um, in a basement and, and not easy to control. Third, and probably the easiest to do transnationally and inflict uh, damage on large numbers of people is biological weapons. Uh, as I'm reminded by people from the uh, Center on Health Studies, the H1N1 outbreak that we had just about five years ago now was biological warfare at the benign level. And it wasn't benign if you're one of the uh, thousands of mostly older people who died from the H1N1 virus, but that's what biological warfare would look like, something that spreads fairly dramatically over a broad geographic area, um, and um, in the future we'll probably see this again either under so-called benign circumstances, still fairly lethal, as we saw with H1N1, but also some other possibilities that we need to be concerned about in the future. The fourth one, which I won't get into too much detail because we could spend the rest of the afternoon and evening and all day tomorrow talking about it, is cyber. Uh, this is not a cyber conference, but um, cyber, as you know, has consumed a great deal of oxygen over the past five or six years and resources in many, many countries, but that is certainly a profound transnational threat, one that has had big impact, especially in countries like Georgia and Latvia and others, as we've seen in uh, real cases just in the past uh, six or seven years. Fifth is terrorism, and I know we'll have more discussion about that now. Um, again, these are not in order of importance, but there is a sense by many people, and also as reflected in our most recent national security strategy from the United States, that we need to pay more attention to other transnational threats and not be totally obsessed with terrorism, which has been a dynamic that we have had for the last 12 years. Now, you have to be very very careful how you articulate that because people get pretty exercised if you tell them that we have invested too heavily in terrorism at the expense of other transnational threats. But there is an increasing sense of that, and it's something that is certainly reflected in a lot of national security documents from um, my own country just in the past uh, three to four years. Uh, number six, financial. Banking, uh, transnational uh, actions that take place in the financial sector and the ability to impact them, but that is a not necessarily a threat because most of it is uh, very positive and upbeat and our global economy continues to do very well, but financial transactions are something that can be impacted and in their own way can be threatening if not handled uh, very carefully. Another domain, number seven, that we don't talk about nearly as much as we should, but one that is truly transnational is outer space. And national security people uh, tend not to talk about the, the space domain as it's referred to in the defense sector very much at all, but space is a uh, vital and increasingly important area, not just for purposes of communications and collections of various types of data, but also because of some of the future prospects for uh, increased utilization of space, uh, hopefully almost exclusively for peaceful purposes, but that is something that is truly transnational, transplanetary if you want to get into the very distant future but one that uh, probably deserves more attention and one that has gotten very little focus for most countries, uh, particularly in the last uh, five or six years, including our own. In fact, we have disestablished our own command, which is responsible for, for outer space in our Defense Department, and that was probably one of the bigger mistakes that we have made in the past uh, 10 years or so. Number eight is drugs. Drugs are one of the most acute transnational threats that we have, and they are truly a threat and uh, consistent with some of the other points I've made, we could spend the rest of the day just uh, treating that transnational threat. 
I know we'll have some good uh, discussion of that later on based upon key source countries for transnational drug uh, challenges, uh, not in the least in the southern Philippines, Afghanistan, and Colombia, uh, which we'll touch on later on today. Number nine, human trafficking. Uh, human trafficking is one of the most, um, you know, just from a personal dimension, uh, jarring uh, dimensions that we have in terms of an international threat. And one, in spite of the fact that we are so advanced here in the 21st century, that just does not seem to be uh, willing to go away. I mean, you would think here in the year 2014 that human trafficking would be well behind us, but it's not. Uh, and it's not something that's just uh, consigned to undeveloped countries. It's the kind of thing that happens uh, at airports right here in the United States. In fact, uh, we've had to take some recent measures to try to cut down on the number of uh, people, the subject of human trafficking, that are brought into this country, as well as so many others, including Western Europe and East Asia and other so-called developed areas. So that is an important transnational threat and one that we all have a responsibility to put under control. Number 10, not unrelated to number nine, but it has to do with refugee flows and the exploitation of refugees, as we have seen most acutely uh, recently with the situation in Syria, but so many other parts of the world where refugee flows are, um, uh, represent a acute challenge in all continents. Uh, for the most part in the Middle East, uh, Africa, to some degree in Latin America and the, uh, the Far East, but refugee flows also represent a transnational threat and one that uh, probably needs additional attention. Okay, so those are just the 10 categories, and you could come up with a, a very different uh, way to put them together, but I wanted to mention it because I think uh, in terms of the topic that we have for this discussion for transnational security threats, uh, we should probably have a broader umbrella and look at some uh, points that folks don't normally uh, think about when they talk about transnational challenges. Okay, just to wrap up, I would mention some things that have to do with recent developments in transnational threats that are noteworthy, consistent with the 10 categories that, uh, that I've already mentioned. Um, the first is the fairly dramatic changes that we have had just in the past three years in what are described as ungoverned and semi-governed areas. And this is important because so many of the adversaries that you have to deal with that are responsible for uh, transnational threats that the global uh, community agrees are things that need to be policed more effectively, uh, tend to go to root in ungoverned and semi-governed spaces. And I think there's an expectation by a lot of people that the adversaries we will have to deal with for transnational threats are going to make things easy for us, but the fact is they will never make things easy for us. They will always go to root at the locations where it will be hardest to get at them or hiding in plain sight in more developed locations where uh, it will be equally challenging to try to counter the efforts that they are um, going to mount, uh, even if they are, quote, merely, unquote, uh, criminal type efforts, but also other things that have to do with international security. We've seen some significant changes, as I mentioned, just in the past few years in ungoverned and semi-governed areas, uh, most acutely because of the overflow from the Syria crisis in Iraq and Lebanon and Turkey. Uh, virtually half the population of Lebanon today is Syrian refugees. Just, just tremendous impact over there that hasn't fully been taken into account. But also in other locations, such as the Horn of Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, especially around Yemen, uh, Mindanao in the southern Philippines, the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, uh, many portions of Africa, primarily in the central regions of the conf uh, continent, but also some other parts of Africa. And um, uh, less and less all the time, we're happy to say, but Colombia. The, uh, Ungoverned spaces in Colombia are far smaller in terms of uh, real estate than they were 10 years ago. And that has largely been a success story, but there are still some, and that needs to be uh, acknowledged. Um, I think the other thing that needs to be mentioned, uh, and I'll just close with this, are the kinds of groups that you deal with that are responsible for transnational threats in the uh, 10 categories that we talk to. And this is used most regularly when dealing with adversary groups, but there, and there are different ways that you can slice it up, but uh, in the intelligence community, for example, and also on the defense side, typically they'll put them into three groups, and that is what we refer to as a core organization, the second one is the affiliates, and the third are the like-mindeds, and I'll just develop that for a second. Uh, but it applies to human trafficking and drugs just as much as it does to terrorism and some other transnational activities. Well, one of the real challenges that we all have on the security side in terms of dealing with transnational threats 
or people that fall into any one of those three categories. Typically, a core group is fairly easily identified, will act transnationally, but you can more or less, from the standpoint of geography, have a sense of where they are rooted. The second category, which are the like-minded, tend to be, the correction, the affiliates, tend to be also dispersed across borders but at the same time, a little bit more difficult to track because they can uh, mount um, activity inconsistent with international security, which is not uh, totally controlled by any central organization. And the third category, which can be the most difficult to counter, what we describe as the like-minded, so it can be anywhere, uh, who will generate, whether it's human trafficking or drugs or criminal activity, some other things, on their own without any recourse or a way to really provide any advance uh, warning for the activities they're doing. So I think in all three categories, relative to transnational threats, we have to deal with that. That cuts across all 10 of the uh, types of transnational um, things that we need to be concerned about that I uh, spoke of earlier. Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to the panel because I know they have much better ideas than I do. And again, I apologize for having to move off, but uh, for those of you that I'll see on Monday, I'll give you a full report on how the veterans are doing coming back from Washington. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, so what we're gonna do now is sort of have a, a, a sort of big group discussion about this. So any questions or any points you wanna raise and then the panel will respond. They have a mic, I have a mic, so if you want to ask a question, stick your hand up and I will come to you with a mic and that is how we're going to work it. So does anyone want to open up with a question? Or does, do you want to say something? Yeah, we can do that as well. That'd be good. Okay, so I'll just, um, because I mentioned before, actually before I start, I wanted to thank uh, Professor Kafir and Ray for um, being here and then for the comments from Professor Moret. He gave a nice rundown of sort of the categorization of how we view transnational threats. But as you'll see by this case study here of AQIM, these categories are, are just not, not very nicely, they're not very neat like that. Um, so again, I'll just speak to the dynamics of AQIM a little bit. Um, I think a lot, of the, a lot of the top 10 categories or top 10 transnational security threats that Professor mentioned um, sort of overlap with, with what AQIM has been involved in in West Africa as well. Um, but also some of these, a few insights that I'll just present here are um, a good way to sort of think about transnational security and uh, especially what Professor mentioned, the Professor mentioned for this, un, this idea of ungoverned and semi-governed spaces um, in sort of this uh, new security environment. So the first thing that, um, I don't know, maybe if Everybody's, I'm assuming everybody has a little bit of knowledge of, of AQIM, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Just a show of hands. Okay, cool, so I don't have to give to a background, awesome. So um, in this new security environment, this idea of affiliations and sort of um, the connections between groups. So uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb sort of um, formally declared their name in 2007. Um, coming from this group called the GSPC when they sort of um, pledged allegiance to Al-Qaeda. So after that, we kind of see this sort of proliferation of groups, these offshoots, um, Mujwa and um, Signed in Blood Brigade, and they sort of have these affiliations with AQIM, and it makes it very difficult to pinpoint who exactly is carrying out the aims and who's giving directives um, is it AQIM's um, Abdel Malik Drukdel, or um, are they actually the groups themselves operating um, and carrying out their aims? So this idea of projected power from a non-state actor's point of view makes it difficult to you know, put them in one place or figure out who actually is carrying it on operation. So that's one aspect of the, the transnational um, activity that sort of um, is embedded within this, this idea of wicked problems. It makes it hard to really um, put a finger down. And then secondly, um, kind of related to that is this changing ethnic comp composition of groups. So uh, we see in this sort of pivot from, the, as the GSPC was based in Algeria, this sort of pivot to other um, jihadist agendas in West Africa, this ethnic composition. 
So in Mujwa and the Signed in Blood Brigade, we see more of like a black African composition, which makes it easier to sort of embed themselves in communities in West Africa and sort of lay down roots as we see in this um, Northern Mali uh, manifestation um, when they tried to take over Northern Mali and Azawa. And so as they bound themselves to these communities and sort of laid down roots through forced marriage and conscription and whatnot, it becomes very difficult to tell where the group is. I mean, when groups are, when uh, counterterrorism operations are, are being undertaken, it makes it difficult to really tell who's the terrorist and who's not. So um, that's the second one. And the third one is sort of this um, changing ideology. Um, sort of in the post Bin Laden environment, um, we see sort of like this flexibility from um, these strict Salafist um, Sharia implementation type of things in the communities. Where we see, it was really interesting because um, in, the, in the rubble that came from um, after the French-led uh, intervention kind of routed some of these forces from northern Mali, uh, some reporters found this memo uh, which sort of outlined from Abdel Melik Drukdel um, sort of to, just sort of to instill in the leaders on the ground uh, sort of to be more flexible and sort of to win you know the hearts and minds that you know the conventional hearts and minds theory win the hearts and minds of the the people in Mali in order to lay down some roots and sort of provide for the long term um, as it were for the for the mission for the jihadist agenda so that was really interesting but that sort of pointed to this this unprecedented flexibility in sort of um, ideology and, and religious interpretation and, and sort of, of course they didn't, um, which is why um, the French went in. But um, it's interesting to, to figure out, um, to, to think about why they're changing this um, ideology and what is, what is the cost benefit of changing this ideology and sort of what is, what is the end goal. So um, those are just some ideas. Um, that I sort of gleaned from studying AQIM that makes it very difficult and also makes it an extremely wicked problem because it's hard to really disentangle a lot of these things. Like I said, um, sort of uh, affiliations, ethnic compositions, and ideologies. These ideas that we usually think of in our heads that are um, sort of this one shape, but really they're really malleable. So um, that's why AQIM is a really interesting case study, but I'll pass it over to Ray. It's just Hey, thank you, Cameron. Appreciate it. Um, so I first became interested in transnational criminal organizations, telling my little personal story, back in 2006. So I'm sitting in a cafe in San Salvador. Uh, I was down there for a military exchange, and our interpreter was a very um, upper-class Salvadoran woman. Uh, her father had been ambassador to Switzerland during World War II and was definitely a member of the Salvadoran elite or the 14 families uh, that they speak of. Um, and she, she kind of sighed and said, oh, I really miss the Civil War. I said, stop, what are you talking about? And she, because from 1980 to 1992, roughly, a brutal Civil War in El Salvador, absolutely brutal. Um, and here's this educated upper class woman telling me she missed it. I said, I did not understand what you said. And she said, no, you did. Um, she said it was so much more peaceful back then. And I was completely taken aback. And what she was referring to was the rise of the gangs in El Salvador, MS-13, Barrio 18. And she said that during the Civil War, the fighting was kind of out in the jungle. It was, it was a way, it was other. And it didn't necessarily impact her day-to-day -day life. But now the gangs were everywhere. They're coming up in influence and brutality and size. And now it affected her. And so I was taken aback that someone would refer to peaceful days of the Civil War. Uh, and it really made me start to think. So I became interested in transnational criminal organizations. I've had the opportunity to travel in Central America about two dozen times. And it's always the lead topic since about, well, since in the past 13, 14 years, and probably before then. Um, so last year, I had the opportunity, as I mentioned, to work with some Colombian soldiers. And the engineers in the group came to me one night in a group and they said, how can we come back here next year to do this mission? It was a humanitarian mission. They were working building schools uh, in El Salvador. 
I said, well, you know, your government will send another contingent. They said, no, 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 no. We want to come back. How can you help us to make sure that we come back? I want to be on this again next year. I'm thinking, wow, because this is a demanding mission. You're, I mean, 125 degrees and you're building anything. Doing anything other than just sitting in the shade is exhausting. Why would someone beg to come back and do this again? And they said, it's so much safer here. Now, these are Colombian soldiers, and back in the day, we thought of Colombia as a war zone, definitely. And now, maybe the general conception is that it's, it's not quite that bad with Plan Colombia and a lot of the strides that the Colombian government has made. And uh, they said, well, when we build things here, no one's shooting at us. And we don't have to wear a helmet and bulletproof vest and have a rifle while we're trying to drive a bulldozer and that sort of thing. And it's just preferable. And so that got me thinking about this other group called uh, the FARC. Because when they were building a road up into uh, FARC territory in the Zona Roja, they had to have an infantry battalion out around them, uh, helicopters overhead, and be fully armored like I was in Baghdad. Um, and that's what they were dealing with. And so they loved El Salvador because they could wear just a regular construction hard hat, no, no uh, bulletproof gear and all that. Um, so it makes you start to think, well, what is this thing called the FARC? Uh, is it a criminal organization? Is it a terrorist organization? Is it an insurgent organization? Is it a political organization? Is it E, all of the above? Um, you could certainly make cases, I think, there over the years as it's evolved. Um, and like a recent development where President Uribe, former President, Colombian President Uribe, was elected into the legislature in Colombia to prevent the FARC uh, from becoming politically drawn into the system, uh, kind of a one issue fellow there, uh, makes it kind of interesting. So what will become of the FARC, especially considering you have a former president who comes into the legislature? It doesn't happen all that often. We've had some lively discussions about whether that matters and if it's significant. And uh, I don't think it happens that often here. I remember I'm from Massachusetts, so John Quincy Adams comes to mind. He did that, but I, I can't think of too many others that have done that. Um, so what's going to happen with them? Um, will they come into the government? Uh, Will they be defeated outright? Uh, could they win and actually take over Colombia? I mean, it doesn't seem likely at this point, but think about all these different possible outcomes um, and what the FARC is and what the FARC sees itself as. And is that coherent? Because that, I don't think that's clear right now either. Um, if you're making good money on the cocaine trade, maybe you see yourself as more caring about the criminal element and less about becoming involved in the political side. Um, I mentioned Plan Colombia. Uh, the United States has invested a huge amount of money into Plan Colombia to try and defeat the FARC and stabilize Colombia. Um, it has been successful in a lot of ways, and Admiral Moret and I have had some uh, discussions about that as well. He feels very positively about Plan Colombia. Um, part of the task force that I mentioned last year was Chilean soldiers and Salvadoran soldiers. They feel quite differently. So while there might be some great support for it in Colombia, we're giving them a lot of money. Their neighbors are a little bit less enthusiastic. And so when the, when the Colombians can do something like run the training center that they're now running for other Latin American countries, the Chileans and the Salvadorans instantly would say to me, well, you know, we could do that too if you gave us billions of dollars. You know, it's not, you know, they're not that great. They're not that much better than us. You just give them all the money. Um, so there's a little bit of a dynamic there that might be more complex than just what we see in Colombia. Um, when you say war on drugs, um, especially to a military person like myself or my friends in the FBI, we just kind of shake our head and say, really? You know, uh, It doesn't feel like we're winning that or have made any gains whatsoever, maybe. Um, I spent some time in Miami at the U.S. Southern Command headquarters with the FBI liaison to U.S. Southern Command responsible for all of Latin America, basically. And he said, look, I've been working this war on drugs for 20 years now, and we got to do something different because it, it ain't happening. And I said, you know, and as a National Guard officer, I feel kind of the same way because under Title 32, we can work a lot of those um, operations domestically, and it's fairly frustrating. Um, so when we think about the drug trade supply side, supply reduction operations, um, 
a lot of money goes into that. And I can't help but think about what else we could do with those funds uh, because maritime interdiction worked great. Uh, and there are some great maps showing what we've been able to interdict at sea, uh, even with those little semi-submersible uh, vehicles that they're using. And I can show you the reduction in those. We're finding them. We're, we're grabbing them up. And what we did was we pushed that trade onto the ground. And we didn't, we interdicted the boats, but we didn't stop or stem the drug trade or the transit. So we've pushed it now onto the land, which, by the way, is where the people live. So we've pushed it through communities. And uh, we're seeing potentially creating bonds between groups like the FARC and MS-13 in Central America, the Mexican uh, criminal organizations, everyone up along the way, and the communities too, who might grow to support them as some of these criminal organizations get smart and start doing community activism, sort of like helping out. So like we were building schools in El Salvador, S some of these transnational criminal organizations are doing the same thing. Uh, and we're competing on that front. If, if you have drug organizations doing humanitarian aid projects, you've got a problem. Maybe you've created something there that you don't want to. Uh, last thing I'll say is we talk quite a bit about the uh, crime terrorism nexus. And while that is interesting, I think it is definitely real uh, and it's evidenced in the FARC and creates a, a complexity there. To me, the more interesting piece is the transitions. Uh, between crime, terror, and political activity. And that's what we're seeing with the FARC. That's what we are starting to see in El Salvador with MS-13, where they're actually becoming politically active and what that means. Can you go from crime to terror to politics and back? Can you do all of these things at once? Do you have to abandon one? And what are the inner organizational complexities of getting your folks who are getting rich on drug trade to give that up for political influence, or do you have to, depending on the country? And so those transitions, I think, are as important as finding those, finding the nexus between crime and, um, and terror. So thanks, I will pass it off to Isaac. Uh, good afternoon to you all. I I'm gonna try and keep my remarks short because I'm sure you all have um, a lot of questions. And I'm, I'm gonna focus on the transnational security threat issue. Uh, now, I'm an instructor, so the first thing I always tell my students, you have to have a theory. Always starts with a theory. Um, and the theory that I'm going to propose to you all here is human security. The way to understand, I would argue, transitional security threats, whether it is Al-Qaeda, whether it is terrorist organization, is through a firm theoretical foundation. And human security serves us uh, to that end because it talks about freedom from one, freedom from fear. Um, and as, as the Admiral alluded, there are 10 key security threats. They're all about human security. When an individual feels fear, when they feel um, um, that they have no voice, or when they are in need of food and shelter, they will engage. Uh, now, if they cannot engage through a democratic process, they will figure out a way. And that's normally me that normally means political violence, AKA terrorism, or other forms because of gang uh, 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 warfare. What I tend to focus on is social identity and how identities are being formed, how groups are forming themselves. And social identity talks about a subjective process. So if I am excluded from a political process, I am going to look to other people who also feel excluded, try and find some sort of connections to them, and then form a group to challenge those who are in their, their positions of authority. And this is why sort of much of the transitional security threats that we are facing today have to be addressed at the root causes. They have to be addressed on an individual basis. It's no longer just about states. It's about people. Um, and, uh, and it's about how we building sustainable institutions. Uh, we are very, very fortunate here in the West, in the United States, uh, that we have free and fair elections. We're able to walk uh, the streets with, uh, without any real fear. Today there are elections in Afghanistan. It's taken us 13 years really to get to another uh, round of elections. Uh, we should also remember that 2,300 American military personnel who gave their life uh, for that uh, 
endeavor. The over $600 billion that had been invested, of course, all of the lives of the coalition members and, of course, of ordinary Afghans were all searching for basic security uh, because ultimately that's what um, the security issue uh, is. It's about providing for yourself and providing for your family. Uh, and um, I, I would strongly urge you all to, uh, whenever you're doing any form of analysis, find a good theory, test it, and then uh, you'll have some solid answers. Thank you. Okay, so I guess now we just move to questions. So if Cameron, do you maybe just want to point out people from the front, pick people from the front, and then I will give them the mic. So anyone want to open up with a question? Someone must have one. Okay, Sheila. Hi, thank you for coming in today. Um, so my question um, brings about um, in regards to looking at maybe not in the West or um, you know the more developed country or industrial country, but really looking at the threats that are coming from the less developed countries. Um, you're touching on you know the um, social identity and how kind of a sociological um, approach to you know interpersonal connective um, institutions and really I guess my I've studied and I've um, in a way analyzed a W. Um, to uh, the World Trade um, um, Organization and looking at the IMF and the World Bank and their impacts, specifically looking at the macroeconomic liberalization model in which they have been basing a lot of their theory, I'm sorry, not theories, a lot of their approach and their strategy on, um, you know, their new reforms are really looking at, in a macro level, um, looking at this agro-export demand, um, looking at really in itself empowering farmers, but empowering the farmers that already have the tools, um, you know, and how that plays in, in a role with security threats. So I guess finding that connection, um, because even though it's not directly correlated, I feel like it does have a large impact in how these groups form in these least developed countries. just give you my two cents, maybe a, a little bit different than uh, the WTO route, but uh, I think one of the most dangerous things on the face of our planet is unemployed males age 18 to 28 or whatever it is. Um, that's, a, that's a dangerous thing. And uh, looking just within our own country. So, all right, so my remarks do not necessarily uh, constitute those of the United States Army in this forum, right? Um, <laughs> I would be more than happy to see drastic cuts in DOD spending if I knew that USAID was going to be actually made functional. Okay, um, and that sort of gets at what you're getting at, I think. But from it, from a U.S. perspective, as a military guy, I would love to see them actually be functional because my impression in in Latin America has been, anytime I've tried to work with them, they can't actually do anything, um, but they can. Maybe if they get some money, they could contract something to be done, maybe. Uh, when I would really love to see them be more of an expeditionary, well-funded, robust, and proud organization that could get in there and have more of an impact. I'd be more than happy to see some, some cuts on to my, my end of the world if, uh, if it meant we could do that. So uh, a book that you may want to visit is Ted Gore's Why Men Rebel, uh, which was written in the 1970s, but still sort of resonates in today. Uh, th and there are different elements that, definitely that encourages individuals to take action. Um, now, yes, the world trade organizations and the various international financial institutions can do enormous amounts of good. It, it, you know, it, we have to be careful not to castigate them as evil empires trying to destroy the developing world. However, there, it has to work in connections with local communities. Yeah. Um, and, and this is sometimes where the challenge is. And if I go back to human security, I can develop a great farming system, but if, for example, I don't have an early warning system about an impending 
natural, you know, a famine that is emerging, then all the hard work that is coming to develop that farming sector is going to go uh, to pot. And, and that's a real shame. So there has to be better, co uh, better connections between international institutions, between states, to help us address these transnational issues. Uh, because if a crisis happens in Mali, it's going to affect Niger. It's going to affect Algeria. And so we need to work a little bit better. We need to talk to each other a little bit better uh, and coordinate our operations. Thank you. Uh, if I could just add to that. I think one of the things that you're, you're really hitting on is this idea of the, the development security nexus. And you know, how, how, what are the best ways? I mean, there's a lot of ink that's been spilled on, on analyzing. How, what are the most effective ways to allocate aid um, without somehow um, having that money go towards, uh, you know, funding terrorism or, or indirectly um, not serving the needs of the people, you know, this idea of the human security. Um, just a couple of, of examples maybe could be uh, like Somalia or South Sudan in which there are some reserves of oil in which private interests are coming in and they're extracting the oil, um, but, the, but the national government needs the money to rebuild their economy, but they're not giving enough money to the people on the ground, and so, in effect, it's not really it's not really improv improving poverty. It's not really improving things that need to bring stability to the state um, in order to uh, you know defeat terrorism, as it were. So it's, it's this whole idea of the development security nexus, I think, is is really important to consider too, especially when you think about wicked problems. Thank you. My name is Hamid Kupai, and thank you for having us here as just visitors. Uh, very great informations, and, and I'm, I'm very happy that, that, that you know, hearing a lot of good information from trans, uh, international securities. But one question I have is, uh, or comments, or, or maybe questions to any of the panel, is that would you agree that our uh, incons inconsistent uh, foreign policy from administration to administration has contributed to many of uh, 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 formation of uh, like uh, you know Al-Qaeda Al Al or, uh, or some of these terrorist organizations uh, around the world, especially in, in areas that uh, there is a lack of education, a lack of, lack of broad knowledge, and the, uh, people in that area, the or, their only guidance to to uh, uh, to be somebody is people like Osama bin Laden or somebody like some radicals that tell them what to do or what 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 you have to do. do would you would you agree that our our uh, uh, national, I mean, our foreign policy? Is, has, has been failing and is going to fail uh, if we continue the same route. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so um, <laughs> whew, uh, that's a tough one. Um, 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 so uh, you definitely need a consistent foreign policy. That, that certainly helps. But the nature of a democratic system is that every two, four, six years, whichever system you have, you, we order a, a new government to come in. Uh, and it is, you know, when we, the voters, decide what kind of foreign policy to an extent they, 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 they will manage. Um, this is where we get now into strategic cultures and strategic thinking. Uh, so I would say maybe the problem is not having an inconsistent foreign policy, but it's not having proper strategic thinking and anticipating what are going to be the threats of the future and therefore adjusting to them. Uh, you know, it's impossible to run a foreign policy when you've got 24-hour news cycle. It's impossible to, to run a, a, a consistent foreign policy when you have so many special interests. However, with effective fall planning, you can address some of those issues. Uh, and it is also important uh, to have, to remain true to your values. So if your value is equal protection, equal rights, 
that has to remain part of your culture, uh, and that has to remain part of your foreign policy. So uh, that's kind of how I would address it. Uh, but again, there are some nice theoretical issues that we can explore. From my end, um, I'll just say that as an army officer, it can be very frustrating. Uh, whereas we're in for sort of the longer haul. It's not a four or an eight year term uh, that we're in there. We're doing it across presidencies, across uh, administrations. And uh, it can be frustrating. Um, it's hard to have a medal that says Global War on Terrorism Expeditionary Medal and then be told there was no global war on terror. We don't call it that anymore. Say, all right, uh, you know, that, that creates a, it, it can be frustrating on our end. But I think I agree with Isaac that if you have the core principles consistent, uh, and if they're good principles, then it's easier to tolerate smaller changes. It's when we have large shifts that it gets harder on the implementation side. And the danger in that is that implementation might not happen. Uh, because there are people who can delay implementation, prevent implementation uh, when it comes time to where the rubber meets the road. And so that's the thing to be very careful of. Hi, I'm Nina Hall. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Hertie School of Governance, so it's great to be here today and hear this panel. I guess I have a question about the framing um, around security, because I think there was very many different ways security was talked about by our first speaker and, and the panelists, and security for whom? And we heard this notion of human security, um, of security, I guess, for the state as well. But I just wondered, is it even a useful term in and of itself? Because I think the second um, we heard a lot about the limitations of the military in the war on drugs, and this has been widely acknowledged. Um, so I wondered if the speakers can talk to this. Is, is, is it useful to, to frame these problems as security problems? And if so, what are the implications of this? Does this mean that the military is naturally the actor that gets involved? And, and in the case of the war on drugs, who would be better? I mean, is it really, like many say, a problem of domestic use of drugs in the US context, which is not really at all a military issue? Can I add, because that was exactly my, <laughs> <laughs> my, my question as well. I don't know if this is some European perspective or something. Yeah. And also from the Hearty School of Governance. I mean, you know, when I heard, for example, the list of security threats, when I think, for example, refugees, you know, considering this under a security paradigm, you know, for me as a kind of European international lawyer, that's a human rights issue is, is, is as much as it's a security issue. And it, not just sort of framing things through the lenses of security, but also framing things through the lenses of transnationalism as well. I mean, so if we think about something like drug trafficking, um, one could also frame that, and I wonder whether it'd be even actually more productive as a domestic US problem, right? So domestically, the US has to think about its drug policies, its incarceration policies, the way in which it views drug use in general, um, and this would be much more helpful. And, and even sort of, if I think of sort of the, the, the other side, the, the people who were trying to fight in terms of security, why have they transnationalized? They've transnationalized in response to the transnationalization also of the West, right? So the, the, the viewing of things as being transnational problems, which justifies this total breach of the traditional system of sovereignty where you know, we deal with our own security problems and we only deal with other countries and where we see a real breach you know, of our own territorial boundaries. As soon as you start to conceptualize things, well, these are transnational problems, you always justify transnational intervention and therefore, you, you also justify, in a way, a kind of transnational response to that intervention, which we see in places like North Africa. So, I mean, this is a little bit of a devil's advocate's kind of point, but I, I'm just wondering about this, you know, conceptualization, how, how useful it is. Yeah, this is certainly interesting questions. Um, just to touch on yours first, I think you have to think about the nature of the geography of, of states. I mean, there, there are borders, but for example, in West Africa, there's a giant expanse of the Sahara, but then there are borders, sovereign borders, that really don't mean that much when it comes to how an organization might navigate through there. So for example, you might um, uh, traffic a bunch of drugs from uh, Latin America to Europe um, through three different states, um, Mali, Algeria, and Niger, Mauritania, or, or 
you know, the, the coastal countries in West Africa, they, they're traveling kind of fluidly, but you can't really think about that with borders. But really, officially, you have to because then the issue has to be framed as a transnational thing because you have to bring uh, national governments in from those three. I mean, it's, it's just, a, it's hard to disentangle those things. Um, but then also, I, I wanted to comment on the security, this framing of the security thing. Um, it's interesting because the U.S. has this doctrine of, of national security, you know, thinking of the homeland, homeland security, it's a big thing. But from the European perspective, that's not, that doesn't really exist. I mean, it's all international security. It's all about how we think about the security um, uh, in the U.S. Um, about the homeland because of certain events. Um, so that, that's like an ongoing debate. And then also talking to um, framing security uh, from the U.S. perspective, I think there are certain things that can be put on the agenda a lot easier if you securitize them and sort of the U.S. national security it, uh, enterprise and infrastructure will sort of mobilize more if you put this on the forefront as like the top security agenda for many reasons, um, funding and the military's um, strength and pull. Um, and then uh, for, so, and then there are more pressing things like existential threats versus something like climate change, which was, I, I can't remember who said it, um, uh, I think he was, it was in the latest QDR, or I can't remember who said it, but he said that climate change was essentially the most important issue. But we can't, we can't get that on the security agenda because it's not pressing. It's not an existential issue necessarily. Um, but it still has great effects. I mean, how, how do you bounce back from a natural disaster? I mean, it always comes back on the agenda after something like that happens, but it's not, you can't predict it, um, and you can't necessarily, um, I guess, wrap your head around it entirely. So, I mean, th those are just to answer a couple of the questions. Hopefully, I, I, I've helped to answer those. So um, I think that framing something as a security threat is sort of the easy slash lazy way to get something through. Uh, as Americans, we get pretty excited about our security. And so if you can tie anything to a security threat, it's a lot easier than saying it's a humanitarian problem in another country because then you run into a whole list of objections. But if you say you are in danger because of then all of a sudden you can, it's easier to get it through or get it funded or make it important. So I think to some extent it's a laziness problem, uh, personally. Um, on, the, on the borders issue and transnational things, a lot of these organizations, I think it's important to look at how they view themselves. Um, MS-13 doesn't necessarily look at itself as a transnational criminal organization. It's a Salvadoran criminal organization. And it was founded in LA, but it's among Salvadoran people. But they don't see much difference between San Salvador, Houston, LA, and uh, Northern Virginia. So they don't see, the FARC doesn't necessarily see themselves as that. And I'll give you one example in El Salvador. On the way to a mission, we went every single day to build the school. The road actually crossed into Guatemala and then kind of crossed back down. And so I said, well, what are those uh, white concrete posts? And the guy said, oh, that's the border with Guatemala. I said, well, back there they were on the right, and now they're on the left. What does that mean? And he said, well, we drive through Guatemala. I said, so I just led a multinational armed force through another country without their permission. You know, call it an incursion or whatever you want, right? It's not a good thing. But no one, it's just not even in the mindset. So, well, we very rigidly, we build a big fence, you know, and we think this is it, and it's surveyed in exactly, and this is the border. And uh, if you live in Sonsonate, El Salvador, uh, bananas are cheaper on the Guatemala side, so you just walk over there and you buy your bananas and then you bring them back. And there is no border, there is no anything. So the way we frame, if we frame these in an American or a Western mindset, I think it can, we can lead ourselves to be incorrect on other things as well, because other organizations don't see themselves as, I am transnational. It's just, that's where my need is, so that's where I'm going. So, uh, it didn't take very long, but I'm going to disagree with Greg. This is a New York, <laughs> New England kind of thing. It, it really doesn't. Um, I actually think, 
Uh, the security framework is really tough to, 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 to suss out. Um, and I, I go back to theory here again. You know, what is security? Security is about identifying threats. What threats are you? And this is then going to lead back to whether you are a realist or a neo-realist or a constructivist or a neoliberal. Uh, once you have that kind of a conversation, and then you're able to have the, your consistent foreign policy, uh, you can then establish what are your core threats. Um, so when I work on post-conflict reconstruction and women's issue, it's better for me to frame the argument as being about security, uh, because that's where I can get more money. That's where I can get more attention. And this is also what feeds into what Cameron was saying about securitization. That's another theory. You know, It's about speech acts. So if you talk about something more and more and more, eventually people will recognize that it is about the existential existence of a state or a subject matter. So I would say to you actually framing is very, very important here, but you have to start with what's your agenda here? What are you trying to accomplish? And how are you trying to emphasize it? So when I try to emphasize um, discriminatory, that discriminatory practices against women are actually bad for the state uh, or for institutions or for the society, I frame it through a security mechanism because it's easier for me than to, t to talk to folks, whether it is in the Department of Justice, uh, in trade and industry, because I can frame it in, a, in maybe in a simpler language, although I don't, wouldn't call it simpler language because that maybe suggests that the folks I'm talking to are simpletons and they're not, they're very, very smart people. Uh, but it's easier to, to extract concessions uh, when you're framing it in, in, in that, in, through that um, mechanism. So that's my disagreement. I agree with everything you said, Isaac, except for what you were wrong about. And, uh, that's the, and I think you proved my point in that um, it is easier, and therefore it is a lazier way to frame the problem. And, um, and I think that the risk that you run of doing that is, one, just the general um, losing intellectual integrity, but also you water down what is a true security threat. And it gets hard to distinguish what was just easier to frame that way versus uh, what is a true or a greater threat, so. Yeah, I'm sure we will. If I can be the voice of reason here, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think a couple of things are happening. Um, the framing idea is, is, could potentially be uh, different when, you're, when there are interests involved and money is involved, but from an analytical standpoint, I think it's very useful to think of, not necessarily framing, but the conceptualization of this transnational idea. Um, in that, I, I'll just cite uh, Kill Cullen from uh, Out of the Mountains. He sort of thinks about um, these areas as subterranean rivers of connectivity. And I think you can't really think about that with borders if you want to approach the problem that, so for example, uh, ethnic Somalis are not all in Somalia, um, but maybe they are the ones that are driving um, one potential aspect of the market. Um, there's a Global Black Spots project that we do at Syracuse that is making a lot of headway in that respect and thinking about these areas without borders. But I think there's a distinction between framing and conceptualizing and, and pitching for interests where money's involved, but analyze, actually analyzing the problem and being able to approach that problem. Um, so. Okay, uh, where else we got a question? I think we got one at the back and then we're gonna come over here. So hopefully we should be able to fit these all in. <laughs> Something over there. Uh, I, actually, I just wanted to sort of push more on that idea of framing. It's something that we've talked about all day. And when, when you think about a wicked problem, uh, you think about a problem where there is no shared definition of what the problem is. So I was wondering if we might be able to take uh, drug trafficking, for instance, um, and sort of hear from one or, or both of, or all of you about how you think stakeholders at the local level, the national level, stakeholders at the international level, across sectors, uh, come at that problem, how they frame that problem, uh, what, and what's really underlying it, um, and, and perhaps start to begin to tease out some of those, uh, some of the tensions between that frame discordance, if there is any, and I'm assuming that there is, um, and perhaps even some of the different priorities in terms of values that those stakeholders come at. Me? <laughs> 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 uh, 
uh, from from the military perspective first. Um, the active component, so we have an active and a reserve component. The active component sees when we talk about drug trafficking, the away portion of that. Uh, our folks in the embassies, we have military folks in virtually every embassy, right, called the mill group or the attache section or whatever it's called in that country. And they are looking at that country and what it does to, with regards to the ambassador's campaign plan in that country. Um, domestically, it falls under the National Guard, right? And we look at it as a support to law enforcement issue. Um, but not necessarily, we're not thinking about the away piece. Right? We're not thinking about Colombia or the, the South American origins of, of what's coming up. We're looking at the border and in. Right? And that's in every, even in little old New Hampshire, we have a counter narco, counter, counter narco trafficking section that wears civilian clothes and is in all these different law enforcement agencies um, across the state. And that's in New Hampshire, not exactly thought of as a hotbed of um, you know, narco trafficking. Um, but there are some routes that go from Boston up to Canada, and so there's an involvement there. Um, on the law enforcement side, depending on what level of law enforcement you're working at frames how you, how you look at it. For the FBI folks, they're either the away FBI guys who are in the embassy you know, with our folks, working closely with the active component military looking at in that country and working with that country. And the folks that are in the US are looking at the fence. And they're looking at from there in. And then depending on what region you're in, there's the county level, maybe. Like in um, Northern Virginia, you see quite a bit of county level involvement or local level involvement. Town cops, like in New England. Uh, and they're all looking at it very differently. Uh, and I think that is a hindrance in a lot of ways because no one is looking, everyone has the blinders on. And there's not a coherent enough law enforcement strategy that unites all of those. Now there's some conferences and you know, once a year they have the, the gang, counter gang conference down in Virginia and okay, that's good and you put some people in touch and maybe they know who to call because that's like 90% of it is just not calling the main switchboard but knowing who to call, right? But everyone's framing this thing in a different way, military, law enforcement, all the different agencies at different levels. And so I would say that we are incoherent because that framing is different at each level. I don't know if that hit what you're getting at, but from from my background, that's how I kind of interpret that. Okay, I think we had a couple more questions up here, and then we might have to wrap up. So, who wants to go first? Uh, I wanted to ask, ask, actually, target Ray and ask from your experiences. You're really saying that you have seen some of the groups move from violence to kind of wanting to do social service or, or at least maintain a community and vice versa. In your observations, are there certain factors, certain times, certain kinds of settings in which this happens? Uh, does it keep going back and forth? Is it a little like what we might talk about Hezbollah where they're doing all of these because they're actually maintaining uh, the people, you know, say in a, that are growing uh, cocoa or heroin or whatever, uh, they're maintaining their livelihoods, and if we get rid of that, that disappears. Uh, and I guess my other question is we tend, it seems like we're stovepiping the secure, the transnational security threats. And I was surprised that conventional weapons were not one <laughs> of the items listed because we often have drugs for weapons as one of the mainstays. And that's one of the reasons of the nexus between terrorists and criminal organizations. So are there, um, you know, it seems like some of the organizations actually are engaged in trafficking <laughs> in WMD components and uh, drugs and weapons. And are there any ways, groups, et cetera, that are kind of trying to put these all together? Okay, so uh, for the first part, um, and thank you for targeting me. Um, the, the, uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> so as for some of the neighborhood impacts that, that I've seen, um, and predominantly that's been in El Salvador, um, 
it takes a few factors that have to come together. All right? So idle people is certainly one. And that is not a simple issue. Uh, take El Salvador, for example. They have temporary protected status for immigration, so they can come to the US and work. Remittances is about 20% of the Salvadoran economy. It comes from the US. Um, folks come up for 18 months, work in Houston, LA, or Northern Virginia, typically, uh, where there's a Salvadoran kind of community. They put each other in touch with each other and get jobs, send the money home. Uh, if you have a relative working in the US and you're getting that remittance money, you might not have to work in El Salvador. So kind of a double-edged sword. Um, that money goes in and maybe it helps improve some lives, but it can also create um, idle hands, which are the devil's plaything, like we say. Uh, so that's a, that's a tough issue. Uh, if you, shut up, you can't certainly shut off 20% of the Salvadoran economy like that and expect to maintain our strongest ally in Central America, if not all of Latin America. Uh, but that's one issue, if there, are, if there are idle people there. The second thing that I've seen is the mayor. It depends on who the mayor is in a Salvadoran region. Um, there isn't really a, a sub-federal, there's not really a state level thing. It's the federal level and then mayors, it's the towns. And the mayors have an, an incredible amount of power and influence in their towns. I've, you think like the mayor of New York City has influence? Wow, you check out a Salvadoran village. I mean, that person's face will be on every building, their, their picture everywhere, and they are everywhere. Um, and how they approach the problem personally makes a big difference. Uh, I know one mayor in San Julian, El Salvador, who decided no MS-13 in my town. And he worked with the Venezuelans to get computers, built a computer center. He worked with USAID and got some concrete to build a skateboard park. He got the, the kids involved in doing it, meaning the teenage males that are the ones building the stuff and they feel ownership. And there is no, there's no graffiti, there's no tagging, there is no MS-13 in that guy's town because he made that decision um, and implemented it intelligently. Um, there are other mayors who look for that money because they can make money off of the gangs and off of that trafficking. And the gangs are more than willing to spend a little bit of money to pay that off. Now the other factor is it has to be in a place that makes sense for the gang. Some place off in the middle of the hinterland is not necessarily going to help them unless they need a quiet way station. It's got to be on a, on a route, on a transit route, some place that makes sense for them. They're not, these guys are not altruistic. You know, this is a business investment. Um, and it also can't be in a place that's of interest to someone else like the Salvadoran government federal government necessarily, or the US government. Uh, we, have, we have bases, we have a base that we co-use with the Salvadorans there. There's nothing right around that in terms of gang activity or those sort of operations. Um, the folks in the community would probably rather have something positive or like we think of legal than to interact with the gang. Um, but if the gang's the only show in town, then that's what they're gonna go to. And that comes back to what I talked about, USAID and those sort of efforts. Uh, I think that all things equal, the Salvadoran people will opt towards the legal thing rather than getting in bed with the gangs. So um, that's just some of the things that I've seen. But the gangs will invest in things like some computers for the school or you know, bikes for some kids, some things will show up and it doesn't take much. In El Salvador you can live on, a family can live on $500 a year. So that's, that's the level you're talking about. It, it doesn't take a whole lot to have an impact. Um, and your second point was on, oh, on weapons. All right, so, no, well trafficking, I will just say this. When it comes to those gangs, they will traffic anything and they really don't care what it is as long as it's not bad for business. So if it's weapons, if it's drugs, if it's human beings, um, it doesn't matter. I, I stood on stage at a school dedication with a mayor who was an FMLN mayor who was a guerrilla during the Civil War who funded his guerrilla unit by trafficking in people, sending them up through Guatemala. Um, 
and this guy, I was revolted, and this guy was standing next to me, and I did everything I could to not be in a picture with him or to shake his hand, or, but he was the mayor, so he was there. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. The one thing that we haven't seen yet is a nexus with helping terrorists, uh, say like uh, Islamic extremists, be smuggled in because the Latin American organizations don't necessarily want to draw that kind of attention to themselves when they're, they have a good thing going with drugs and people and weapons. But it doesn't matter if it's weapons or anything. OK. okay. Um, hello. I would like to target uh, Isaac here this question. Um, First of all, uh, it's really refreshing to hear someone who's emphasizing the role of theory. I cannot but agree more. I think it's super important. And it also organizes uh, the, de the, the debate. Uh, and I do also appreciate the fact that you've started very strongly with social linking the whole thing to social identity. But I would like to push you a bit, because in the sense that social identity is also mutually constitu constitutively related also to our motivations and interests as, as well, right? And the manner in which we construct these interests. But at the same time, all of these are embedded also in geographies and with all of these complex considerations of geographies. And you know what? It's also not only geographies, also temporalities and rhythms and long, uh, long durées, if I, if, I, if I may use that particular term. So what I'm trying to say with all of these complexities and their links is like, Perhaps shouldn't we, shouldn't we be also, in it, if we take theory also seriously, we should also in a way problematize the word transnational because we also have to look into the, actually the specific. I mean, if we're going to take all of these things seriously, I mean, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we should also research how they are connected. But what is striking me, is striking me so far is that actually we need to also be specific that every particular kind of phenomena is unique in itself and should, should be studied in itself before we actually open Pandora's box and start making all of these links. I would like to hear a bit more from you in relation to this. So yes, I, I totally agree. I mean, that's the challenge with social identity. It's such a subjective term. Uh, and as I, I've basically decided I'm going to devote the rest of my academic life to try and define social identity. So hopefully if you ask me in 20 years, I'll have a more coherent argument. Um, it's, it's a tricky situation. Uh, at the moment, what I'm doing when I'm trying to understand what is a, or how social identity is framed, I'm looking at case-by-case -case scenarios. So at the moment, I'm just looking, let's say, at the Taliban in, in, in Pakistan. What's making this group, this network, this set of individuals come together and do what they do? Uh, and at the, what I'm seeing, at least with Pakistan, it's exclusion. Uh, it's an element of ethnicity, it's an element of religion, and it's violence. Uh, now that, of course, then leads to the question, is it the nature of the Pakistani state to breed these types of groups? Possibly, probably, but I'm still waiting for the data to come in. Uh, so, yes, social, to me, social identity is one way to try to understand the security challenges that we're facing and why individuals are engaging in drugs or crimes or, or, my, or my, my, uh, migration, but I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, and this is what theory is about. Uh, I mean, this is also why, at the same time, I don't want to have a theory that explains everything, because then it doesn't explain anything at all. So case by case, so, but give me time. I'm going to spend the next 20 years trying to figure it out. Okay, unfortunately, and apologies to people who still have questions, we're going to have to wrap it up there because we did say we'd finish at 5.30 and it's now five minutes past. So we're going to have to finish there. But anyway, um, please first join me in saying thank you very much to all our speakers. <laughs> today. Thank you all very much for coming and sharing some of your stories and expertise, or in the case of Cameron, his knowledge. <laughs> um, and I just want to say from everyone on the conference committee, some of whom are still here, some of whom have been here throughout the day. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I understand the whole day has been very successful and there's been some good discussions had by, all this, by everyone attending on some of the wicked problems that we face in the world today. So thank you all for coming and we'll see you all, well, probably not next year because we're all going to be moving on, but <laughs> hopefully some of you might be back here next